Good evening. I'm Cheryl Dorchinsky from the Atlanta Israel Coalition. On behalf of the Atlanta Israel Coalition and our fantastic partners, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions, share where you're signing in from, and how you've heard about the event. Our time is limited, but we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Joining me tonight is Rahil Raza. She's an advisor from the Clarion Project. Rahil, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I want to thank uh, the Atlanta Israel Coalition, the Clarion Project, and all your partners uh, for making this happen. And it's, it's really an honor to be here. It's definitely an honor to have you. So you're a Pakistani Canadian journalist, an author, an anti-racism activist, and an interfaith discussion leader who opposes Islamic extremism. Tell us more about who you are, what you propose as an activist, and what led you down this path. Thank, thank you for that question. So I oppose all kinds of extremism, but because I'm a Muslim, I speak out only about my faith because that's what I know the most about. And I've always believed that if there's garbage in my backyard and garbage in my neighbor's backyard, I need to clean up my garbage first before I criticize anyone else. And speaking from within the faith is very important. I was born in Pakistan in a culture where women were supposed to be seen and not heard. And uh, women's rights is a passion of mine. That's something that I do. Um, now, why growing up in Pakistan? I grew up some beautiful aspects of Islam, plural, pluralism, tolerance. We celebrated everything. And I give away my age if I would tell you that I saw the political ideology taking over the spiritual aspect of Islam. So I spend a lot of time explaining to people the difference between Islam as a spiritual message and Islamism, which is a political ideology. In your early years, you were taught to believe a certain way about Israel. Was there an event that triggered you to start thinking differently? And at some point, did you start to support Israel? And if so, what does that really mean to you? Okay, so, um, you know, when I was growing up in Pakistan, nobody ever talked about Israel, good, bad, nothing. I mean, it was just not something that, that was discussed on the table. But I now later on look back and I think that there must have been a Jewish presence uh, there because in Karachi, the main city where I grew up, there was architecture from architects who were Jewish in, in the earlier years. And then later on, when my interest in Israel grew, I found that there is a Jewish cemetery in Karachi, which by the way is looked after by a Muslim family. And I saw a documentary on that. So there, um, you know, must have been a presence, maybe a small one, but nobody ever identified themselves. And then I left Pakistan in the late 1970s, went to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and lived there for 10 years. I'm sure I must have met uh, members of the Jewish community there, but again, there was no uh, identification. Now you, you asked me about the trigger point, and uh, I think that there were two main uh, triggers there. One of them, of course, was uh, when I came to Canada and I had my, an opportunity to take my first trip to Israel. And I have to admit that, you know, I also had the preconceived notions. I also, uh, you know, had my own personal biases from what I had heard people around me say. But um, in Canada, I interacted socially and met members of the Jewish community. I met people from Israel. And since human rights are very important to me, what stood out was that humanity is one community and we've got to know people. You and I know that ignorance is our worst enemy and it leads to biases, it leads to prejudice, racism, hate, all the bad things that we don't want. So I wanted to educate myself and as a child I had read the diary of Anne Frank Later, I had started reading Leon Uris. So there was an innate curiosity to know more about the people who these stories were about. And uh, I only had that chance when I came to Canada. That's fantastic. Um, as a Muslim, help us understand though, the difference between the words Islam, Islamic, Muslim, and Arab. And how does Islamic <laughs> fundamentalists fit into this as well. I know you do a lot of work in this area and uh, I know it relates to Israel. So I appreciate 
you elaborating. Yeah, well, Islam is the faith. It is the youngest of the three monotheistic faiths. I'm sure many people know about this. In fact, in many ways, I call Islam Judaism light because there is so much that is taken from Judaism in Islam. You know, there was Judaism, Christianity, and then Islam. And the people who follow Islam are called Muslims. Um, fundamentalism is like any other form of extremism. Is it people who just look at the dogma and do not uh, look at the deeper meaning, do not look at the spiritual message uh, of the faith. Um, it's very important uh, for your audience and the listeners to know that only 20% of the 1.8 billion Muslims in the world are Arabs. And all, every Muslim is not an Arab and every Arab is not a Muslim. And this is somewhere where people get totally confused because the Middle East crisis seems to identify um, what Muslims are about, and in many cases for Muslims, what Israel is about. They can't seem to look at it through any other lens. And I decided that I'm going to look at this through a human lens. I'm going to look at this uh, through a different lens, through an interfaith lens, if so, to, so to speak. And I started reading and, and, and researching. Of course, uh, the Arabs have somehow decided that, you know, they are the guardians of the faith. But you know, if we go back uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, who said that an Arab and a non-Arab are not any any different, uh, you know, from from each other. So the fundamentalists and the extremists have politicized the spiritual message. They've run away with the political message. They've left behind the social, the human, the spiritual message, which is the larger part of our scriptures and our faith. And I understand from my conversations uh, with my Jew Jewish friends, especially those who are scholars, that there is uh, something similar to what I, we have been told in the Quran, that humanity is but one community. And so that is the basis of the work that I do. That is the foundation of the work that I do. Well, we all know that there are societal differences within Muslim countries and Israel on a fundamental level. And I know you touched upon some. Um, is that enough for Muslims not to support Israel? And what is your argument as to why they should support Israel? Oh, I have many arguments and I could talk to you about this uh, for a very long time. But, uh, you know, I can't speak on behalf of 53 Muslim countries. As you understand, I can't speak on behalf of 1.8 billion Muslims. I speak for myself and many like-minded people in my organization and in the Muslim reform movement. The idea is not to say whether they should support Israel or not, but they must accept the right of Israel to exist as a country and exist as an equal country, because if there are differences, and of course they can be, uh, you know, I, the, one of the beauties of uh, Israel, as I found when I went there, is that they are more critical of their own policies than many other people from the outside. So one can be critical, but in order to do that, you have to recognize the other. And you uh, can't have these discussions if you don't recognize the other as an equal. And, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, over a period of time, uh, what I have seen that Muslims are taught that they, uh, you know, indoctrinated with the idea that Jews are planning to destroy the Muslim world and Muslims. And that to me is the worst form of anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, Jews have been the most persecuted nation on earth. They have only one country known as Israel, which is even smaller than Karachi, the, the country that I grew up in. And I cannot understand why they are considered to be the cause of, of misery for 1.8 billion Muslims. So, you know, there are, there are issues there which are very problematic, which are not logical, which are delusional, which have been politically instigated. And this has led to Israel being physically and psychologically attacked since its inception. And I'm going to go back once again to the trigger that you had mentioned. So after coming to Canada, I was accredited to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. And for five years, I would go there three times a year. And I was appalled when I first saw that the only purpose of the OIC, which is the Organization of Islamic Conference, 53 Arab Muslim countries, was to blame Israel for everything. If there was a storm in Pakistan, it was blamed on Israel. If there was persecution of Christians in Africa, 
they invoked Israel at every point and constantly slammed Israel and the United States. And when I saw, and saw this happening and nobody rebutted this, I found it very disturbing. So I decided to try and understand this little country and the people a little more by meeting them, by getting to know them and uh, to read about it. And of course, no better way of doing this than, than to go visit uh, the country which everybody is slamming all over the world. And when you got to know them, how was their reaction to you being a Pakistani born observed Muslim who supported them? Well, you know, there was a lot of curiosity. And one of the most uh, beautiful things about Israel, I mean, there are many things I love, but one of the most beautiful things is that they are not politically correct like me, and I love that. So there was curiosity as to why a Pakistani born a Muslim, practicing Muslim woman would be so interested in Israel, uh, come back and why would she support? And, and by the way, um, I've been to Israel 13 times and more than many Jewish uh, people. Uh, the last time I went, uh, the immigration officer at Tel Aviv airport uh, saw my passport and he looked at me and he said, where is your Israeli passport? And I thought that that was really poignant. It, it, it was a significant, it was, it was a sign. And I laughed, I said, well, maybe you know something that, that I don't. But, um, you know, people were curious and they were willing to sit and talk. Now, I traveled, the first time I went, I traveled across Israel, which of course, as you know, is, is not a large country. Uh, but uh, the, the interest that everyone had, and you know, some of the, the places where I was invited to speak, they had done homework about my interests. Um, nobody ever questioned me as being a Pakistani or a Muslim, but they questioned me about my interest in Israel and who I am and what I do and why do I do what I do. And, uh, you know, it's never stopped. In every uh, trip I've gone, I've met more people. And by the way, from every side, I've met uh, Israeli Jews, I've met Israeli Arabs, I have met Palestinians. So, uh, you know, I haven't confined myself to meeting just one kind of people. I've met young people, older people. I found that uh, Jerusalem is my city of joy, you know, the ambience of faith there. Uh, the fact that the three faiths intertwine so beautifully, the history just fascinates me. I weep every time I'm there. I have prayed at the Dome of the Rock as a Muslim. I have prayed in, at the uh, Western Wall, and I have prayed in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So how much more profound can it be for someone who is involved in interfaith dialogue, uh, who has read the history and seen so, you know, the, the signs there, so, um, you know, it has been both from a faith perspective as a Muslim and as an activist, as a woman, it has been very inspirational. For me. And I encourage everyone that before they um, make their decision, they should go visit Israel at least once because it's going to change their mindset. Uh, it's going to change their pre preconceived uh, notions. Uh, and, and they're going to be able to talk to people and ask their questions. I appreciate you saying that. I mean, honestly, Israel, visiting Israel for the first time truly did change my life. And I think people of all faiths, like you said, they're, they go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher or um, Dome of the Rock or the Wall, regardless of you know, your religion, there's definitely a big impact that Israel can have on your heart. Um, what similarities do you see between Israel and your native Pakistan? Well, the, the interesting part is that Pakistan and Israel were created at around the same time in, in history. And they were, uh, you know, through a UN resolution, not through any kind of aggression. Israel as a homeland for the Jewish people, uh, Pakistan as a homeland for, for the Muslim people. And one of the questions as a, a uh, native Pakistani I always ask is, why is that the international community accepts Pakistan's right to exist, but not that of Israel? Now, uh, you know, ha ha having said this, 
Israel has gone through great development and, you know, they're futuristic. Uh, they have focused on science and art and culture. And, and, and that's one of the attractions that I have for this country is to see how in this arid desert they have created, uh, you know, lush orchards and they are self-sufficient. And not only that, they have provided the world with so much technology. So, you know, one has to, to look at the, at the larger people, not uh, at the larger picture. But I have to uh, confess very honestly that when I speak to people in my own community, they, they don't, uh, you know, see, see a difference. For them, it is the brainwashing, it is the mindset. Because again, they look at Israel as only through the lens of the Middle East crisis. They can't seem to separate from that. Now, when you do that, and, uh, you know, with the kind of brainwashing that has been done uh, for many Muslims because of political ideology, um, it's difficult for them to look at Israel uh, through a positive lens. But coming back to getting to know people, uh, coming back to dialogue and discussion, um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share with you a very interesting incident. Last year, I took a group of eight uh, Muslims, you know, diverse Muslims, to the Israeli consulate in Toronto. Uh, the consul general is a very good friend, a wonderful person. She said, you know, I would love to meet them. Now, these eight people had never met an Israeli, had never interacted with a Jewish person, had no clue, and they were terrified. You know, what is going to happen? I said, nothing. We're going to have a dialogue. If you have any questions or concerns, bring them to the table because they're willing to answer your questions. So we went, it was a lovely meeting. And when we finished and, and, and we sat for coffee and we're having a sort of a debriefing, they said to me, but they're so human. They're so much like us. They're such nice people. And I'm thinking to myself, how ignorant can one be? You, you understand what I'm saying? That this human element of meeting people, of seeing them as other human beings, of their, their joys and their pains and listening to them with an open mind. And an open mind is very important. You know, a lot of people have very closed minds. It's just what they have been brainwashed to believe. We are seeing this now through this COVID-19 crisis. Do we believe everything that is out there? Do we want to look at the propaganda? The conspiracy theories abound especially after 9-11. And one of the, the, the factors here is that it's very easy to rally people around a common enemy. It's human nature. And when religion is used as an opium of the masses, I think it was Karl Marx who said that, then it becomes really, really a subversive agenda. It becomes very profound and people start believing everything that is said. Yes, that definitely. Uh, Am I speaking too fast for you? Not too fast for me. Hopefully okay. not too fast for everyone else. People I'm sure okay. will make uh, some comments in the QA and let us know. Okay. Now you and I spoke a bit and you mentioned the hate that you're seeing and um, the threats and people trying to silence you. And I know this is a very personal question and it holds heavy on my heart that you dealt with this. And that, you know, of course, I've seen it personally now. I understand um, how closed-minded people can be. It's, it's tragic. You have a fatwa on your head. How do you sleep at night knowing that people want to silence you to that degree? That is the ultimate, right? Can you explain what that is? And Yes, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Cheryl, by the way, I am a great sleeper. I lie down at night, I wake up in the morning, and a friend once said to me that you must be guilt-free guilt to sleep so well. And I took that to heart. I think I am guilt-free. Um, I do what I do because I have a passion for, for the cause. Now, when I started this journey at a very young age, the journey to, up, uh, to uphold human rights and women's rights, uh, you know, I, of course, started getting pushback even at that time, because when people don't agree with you, they want to push back regardless of whether you are right or wrong. And, uh, you know, but there are people who are full of hate. There are evil agendas. 
they want to silence me not only through a fatwa, but I've had death threats. Um, I have been intimidated. I get hate mail. Um, I am now dealing at the moment with, with a lawsuit. So it's, it's never ending. But what I have learned to do is understand that the work that I'm doing, or I'm trying to do to build bridges of understanding between communities, uh, you know, to get people to understand uh, what Israel and the Jewish people are all about, is a very small drop in the ocean of the hate that is being directed towards me. Contrary to that, there are thousands of people who support me. It is people like you, it is people like the Clarion Project, who I work very closely with, who give me a voice, who support me. And, you know, that just makes the, the, the whole pro thing much easier to acknowledge and understand. This doesn't mean that as, as a person, I don't feel hurt. But the other thing is, as you know, I'm not being paid to say what I do. You know, I'm not on, on, on the payroll of someone who's telling me this is what you have to say and, and do. My soul is still my own. I haven't sold my soul, whereas many of these organizations who tend to slam me have uh, sold their souls. They do it because they're being paid big bucks. But I want to share with you what is very dangerous. What, what's dangerous is not that the SPLC or you know, any other organization uh, you know, uh, directly or indirectly claim that I, am, uh, I speak out against Islam, which of course I've never done because they've never been able to prove it. I'm a practicing observant Muslim. I love my faith. What I speak out against is the politicization of my faith, the radicalization, the extremism, the terrorism, the violence against innocent people. And I think every human being needs to do that. But when the SPLC, uh, you know, labels me and then publicly puts this out, it gives any Yahoo the carte blanche to take a pot shot at me. And I mean pot shot li literally, because for them, I become an apostate, I'm a heretic. And, you know, they think that they'll go to heaven if they put a bullet through my head. So this is where it becomes dangerous. And I think that these people, who um, you know, are doing this propaganda are cowards because I invite them to come and speak to me directly. Let's have a dialogue and discussion. You don't have to agree with everything I say, but at least know who I am, know where I'm coming from, ask me the right questions. Now, in the, uh, on, the, on the Islamist extremist side, which is the Muslim fundamentalist side, they largely hate me because I'm a woman. <laughs> You, you you know very well uh, that the, the the whole gender thing is is an issue. I mean, there's nothing that ISIS is more terrified of than than women who will stand up to them. Um, and so uh, the fact that I'm a woman, the fact that I took it upon myself to lead mixed gender prayers, is something that they just can't stomach. And so the backlash from them is for a different reason. Uh, the backlash from uh, Western organizations who are not Muslim, who take it upon themselves to be God and judge that I am not a good enough Muslim. How dare they? Mm -hmm. you know, how dare they decide that I am not a good enough Muslim? Are they a fly on the wall? My Islam, my faith, my interaction, my practices as a Muslim are between me and my creator. I don't have to publicize them or constantly prove to someone that I am a good enough Muslim. You see, so I don't give those explanations. I'm, I'm sort of saying this to you because, you know, we are on a public forum and I think it's important to understand that I do the work that I do because I am a Muslim. You know, my scripture tells me there is a line in the Quran that says, condemn that which is evil and condone that which is good. So even if the evil is coming from my co-religionists, if it's coming from aspects of my faith, if it's coming from the outside, it is my moral and ethical responsibility as a Muslim woman, as an activist, to speak out against that. Because I believe, um, as a believer, that on the Day of Judgment, I will have to answer the question, when the world was burning, what did you do? I don't have to answer for anyone else. I have to answer for myself. And in the end, 
I'm answerable only to the creator. I'm answerable to God, whether you call him Yahweh or Allah or God, just the one creator who we all believe in as children of Abraham. And that for me is the foundation of the work that I do. That for me is the inspiration for the work I do. And between you and me, Cheryl, for all these years that I've been an activist, God has really protected me. I feel that there is a cloak of protection and amazing support from wonderful people who understand that speaking the truth is not something that we should be afraid of. Uh, we should have the courage to speak out because I'm not in this for popularity. I gave up being popular when I turned 50. <laughs> I learned that you can either be popular or truthful. So I'm not in this for popularity. I don't need people to like me. I don't need them to mark like on their Facebook page. I want to be truthful. I want to be respected. I want uh, to, to uh, be understood more than I need to be liked. So because of this, I continue to do what I do, regardless of the backlash, regardless of the threats, uh, because, hey, they want to silence me, they're going to have to wait till the day I'm no longer here to silence me. Well, I'm grateful that you're speaking with us tonight. So where do we go from here? Um, for our audience, what can we do to help change opinions and share the truth as you do? Well, um, you know, it is a, this is a difficult question. Uh, as you know, change doesn't come overnight. Uh, for, for me as well, it has been a journey. It has been a lifetime journey and it continues to be a journey of, of learning, of knowledge. And here is where I think uh, the, the, uh, some of the key uh, norms for change come. It is about knowledge. It is about getting rid of the ignorance. It is about learning from each other, learning about each other. We have to remove the ignorance and the fear that feeds the hate, and for this we need dialogue. I don't believe we have enough honest dialogue. There's a lot of interfaith groups, which is wonderful. I have been part of uh, interfaith groups since I came to Canada, but we have to talk about the hard issues. We have to talk about the difficult issues, not just fluff stuff. You know, this is not about your latkes and my samosas. It is about uh, putting the hard issues on the table and asking the hard questions. And we shouldn't be, be afraid to do that. Then, of course, uh, you know, when I meet with members of the Jewish community, I find that, you know, they're confused as well. It's hard for them to, uh, to accept the, the, the cre credibility that a Muslim, an observant practice in Muslim would, would support, support Israel. And where can they find people with open minds, uh, you know, who, who don't have an agenda? And, uh, you know, what we are looking for is not necessarily everyone has to be a staunch supporter of Israel, but they should at least be open to discussion and debate. Uh, you know, they should be uh, open to uh, asking, uh, answering questions or asking questions. And my uh, main interest in the work that I do has always been and will continue to be our next generation, which is our youth. Uh, you know, I'm a has-been. <laughs> the, the future of the world belongs to our youth. And, uh, you know, it, uh, I wouldn't want to be a youth in this day and age. They're very troubled because of the trauma they see around them. Uh, you know, they see the world in a, in a mess. They see people of faith divided. They see human beings divided. Uh, they see countries divided. It's important to bring our youth together. And this was one of the discussions we had uh, with the members of the Israeli consulate who were so open to the idea that, you know, maybe through cultural programs, maybe through art, culture, music, uh, not religiosity, uh, you know, through discussions, we can start bringing our youth together. And once the youth interact, I think the elders will automatically come into the fray. Uh, so, and, and the youth are full of questions. They just don't have uh, forums where they can answer them. You know, in, in the work that I do um, about speaking out against radicalization and extremism, I always say that between the mosque and the mall, there isn't a safe space for Muslim youth to ask their difficult questions, especially those who are living in the West, who are exposed to diverse cultures, 
who are you know meeting uh, different communities every day how do they navigate that if the messaging that they are getting from their religious leaders is one of division and not one of togetherness so they're getting mixed messages uh, you know, maybe the imam at the mosque is telling them you shouldn't meet Jews, they're evil people and, you know, Israel is the enemy. And then they have classmates who are Jewish. So how do they navigate that? Uh, so I think that, that this is very important. We have to have dialogue. We have to have open minds. We have to educate ourselves about each other, not just about, uh, you know, about one particular community, but about each other. Now. In, when we talk about uh, educating each other, Cheryl, I don't know if, if you are aware that, uh, you know, in Canada where I live, and I would say largely in North America, there are Muslims from almost 60 different parts of the world. It's a very, very diverse faith. You know, people have this misconception that Muslims and Islam is a monolith, that, you know, everyone wears the same clothes and they believe, believe in the same way. No, it is very diverse. And, you know, we have different languages, different cultures, different nationalities. We come from uh, different backgrounds. And within the, the world of Islam, people practice Islam in different ways. And they have a right to do that. As I said, it's a personal way of connecting with the creator. Because in the end, that's what it is about submitting to the will of God. And if we believe in the one creator who has created all of humanity, people have different ways of interacting. So just that, uh, that uh, diversity becomes a great point of discussion. And based on this, for the last five years, uh, my husband and I have taught courses at the university here in Toronto on Islam and various aspects of Islam. And, uh, you know, our, our audience is mostly, uh, well, 99.9% .9 non-Muslim, uh, believers, non-believers, just curious. And it's amazing that the course sells out in 10 minutes because people are so curious and they want us to keep on doing this because it's an open forum. Nothing is off the table. All questions can be asked. Gives us an opportunity to, again, have that dialogue and discussion about hard issues. Well, that's fantastic. We need you guys here. <laughs> well, we'd love to come. get in that class. <laughs> Absolutely. When this is over, we would love to come. Fantastic. The invitation is there. Okay. Um, we've got some questions from the audience. I unfortunately can't read the ones on the screen, so we will be jumping in and doing a voiceover. Um, but we did get an email. You were talking about the youth. Uh, a viewer wants to know, how do we get the UNRWA Palestinian textbooks as well as other anti-Israel and anti-Semitic curriculum to be changed? How do we get them changed so that through education, we can combat this bias and anti-Semitism and achieve peace. Thank you. Thank you. That is an excellent question because anti-Semitism, the BDS movement, the Israel Apartheid Week are all evil agendas. And we have rallied against them very, very openly and clearly. And the anti-Semitism that comes from the curriculum in, in some of the Islamic schools, for example, or whatever is being taught is something that we have to address. Now, it can be done individually by lobbying your members of parliament, and we have done this in Toronto. Uh, there was a, an Islamic center here that had uh, books uh, which came from Iran. And in, within the books, there was hate against Israel and the Jewish community. We complained, we had the books taken off uh, their curriculum and their roster. And so, you know, the change did come. Now, this is something which um, scholars and, and people have been looking at for a long time. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia was one of the countries that used to uh, publish and print uh, books that were very anti-Semitic. Now, with the change that has come through their relationships with the United States, one of the things they have done is publicly agreed that they're going to take out that curriculum. They're going to remove those, those books that are anti-Semitic. So again, each one of us has uh, to, to take the onus and responsibility to be a small kind of an activist. Not everyone is an activist because it comes with a lot of flashback, but be an activist in a small way for human rights. And anything that, that 
uh, is leading to hate of another is not human rights. It's against human rights abuse. So my advice to non-Muslims has always been that if you don't want to focus on the faith, because that can be a very uh, you know, tricky path, focus on human rights. If at any place there are, teach, there are books with the curriculum is teaching hate, you can point to it as something that, des that goes directly against human rights. And those should be pulled. They have to be changed and we must find where the funding is coming from. So one of the uh, aspects of my activism has been for many years to tell Western governments to look and see where foreign funding is coming into their educational institutions because foreign funding comes with an agenda. In the United States, there are universities and educational institutions that are funded by, by those countries that are very anti-Semitic. And so we need to look at where the foreign funding is coming from. I gave testimony to the US Congress Home uh, Committee on Homegrown Terrorism. And one of the points that I made was that they must check, track the funding that is coming from foreign governments. And then if they can, they should stop it because that comes with subversive agendas. And this is where the curriculums are made. This is where you have anti-Semitism and BDS and all these uh, you know, terrible movements which are so vehemently against uh, the Jewish people. Do you see BDS as anti-Semitism or something totally different? Well, of course it is. It is flaming anti-Semitism. I, I mean, there's no other way to describe it. It's a hate fest. All of these are, what is, the, so you ask yourself the question, what is it based on? It's hate. You see, the foundation of this is hate and animosity towards a particular people. Now, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. At many universities, they host what this, this hateful, terrible, um, uh, you know, uh, what is it, a uh, program called uh, Israel Apartheid Week. So I went to one of those and I said, okay, you live in a country where you have the freedom to do this. And that, by the way, is also part of the problem is that these uh, extremists and fundamentalists use the freedom that the West gives them to promote their own subversive agendas. They could never do this in some of the Muslim countries I know of. However, I went to one of these and I said, if you think that you have the freedom to do this, you have the right to do this, I can't argue against that. But let me tell you that you should need to have a table about Saudi apartheid and Pakistani apartheid and you know all the apartheid that is taking place in the Muslim world. Why is there such an imbalance all the way from the United Nations Human Rights Council down to universities? It's only one-sided against Israel. Where is the balance? Why do they not talk about the persecution of minorities in Pakistan, about the killing of uh, Christian communities in Africa, about, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, the human rights violations are so many that you can't even count them on the fingers of both hands, you know, against women. They behead people, they arrest people and jail them and torture them. They don't allow women to drive. So where is the, apart where is the gender apartheid week against Saudi Arabia? Uh, so then, of course, there is no answer, it's blah, 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 because it's a hate fest. Uh, and, and it's important that members outside the Jewish community speak out against these things. So I'll give you an example. Every year in Toronto, there is an Iranian-funded program called the Al-Quds Day, Al-Quds Day Parade, they say, which is nothing but a hate fest. And I have to say, I'm very hurt and and actually quite shocked to see some members of the Jewish community come and support this as well. And, uh, you know, well, ignorance can, can be everywhere. Right. We have filmed it, we have reported it, we have written to our government and said, why do you allow hate against another community? Because that's all it is, it's a hate fest. You know, it's one thing to support the right of another community to exist and I do that. But that doesn't mean that you promote hate against one community to, to, to support another one. You, you understand what I'm saying, but this is all a hate fest. Each one of us as a citizen of the country has a right and must have a right to speak out against these human rights violations. I couldn't agree with you more.
Yes, I am a founding member of the Muslim Reform Movement, which is a very active movement. And um, as a reformist Muslim, uh, we believe that we have to be tolerant uh, with everyone. Now, um, you know, when you say say Islam, then it, it's not really it's it's not really a noun. We talk about a seventh century scripture. We talk about a seventh century uh, message, which may have some aspects that were applicable in the seventh century because it was a different time and place. Uh, these were the lands of Arabia, where all kinds of inhuman practices were present, and there were many. There are many aspects of the Quran which are uh, which are historical, which are for a time and place, which are not universal messages. Whereas there are other messages. Uh, parts of it, which are very universal messages, just like in the Torah and in the Bible, which are messages of humanity about mercy, compassion, do good to others. So yes, uh, in, in the reform movement, we look at that messaging. We say that some aspects which are not applicable today in the 21st century need to be parked in the seventh century parking lot, which you know people find a little amusing, but yes. Uh, just like uh, Jews and Christians have done from uh, parts of their own scripture, which they don't practice anymore because they were for a certain time and place. We as Muslims also need to look at some of these portions and park them in the seventh century parking lot, moving ahead with those aspects, which are universal human rights, which are about compassion and mercy, which are compatible with other Abrahamic faiths, which are compatible compatible with humanity. That would be giving away my age. Uh, I um, uh, so we chose to move to Canada because I has, as I had mentioned in in the early part of my introduction, my husband and I were both activists for human rights, and we did we saw growing up in Pakistan. Uh, in the first two decades of my life, uh, the the downward trend coming from uh, Saudi Arabia, which was funding Pakistan, and we had a fundamentalist president, and suddenly all our freedoms were at stake. Uh, you know, the freedom that I had as a woman, freedom of speech, uh, religiosity was being thrust down our throat, and uh, the version of Islam that was being pushed in Pakistan was the Saudi Wahhabi Salafi version. And it did not sit well with us because uh, interestingly enough, um, I was born in a Sunni family. Sunnis are the largest majority of Muslims. And so my husband was born in a Shia family, uh, which is the second largest majority. And they have been at loggerheads e with each other for 1400 years. And our children, by the way, are Sushis. Uh, half Shia, half Sunni, and so uh, so uh, we uh, decided to leave Pakistan because uh, the winds of change were there, and they did not bode well for the kind of work that we were doing. And as a woman, as a Muslim woman, speaking out against these ideologies was a very dangerous trajectory for me because many people have been killed for speaking out. So we left and we uh, came to the United Arab Emirates. We lived in Dubai for about eight years, uh, where um, it was different, but still uh, it was not entirely, uh, you know, uh, open freedom or the kind of freedoms that we have in the West. And then there was an opportunity to migrate to Canada. So we filled out our papers, we were accepted and came to Canada uh, 33 years ago. So if I calculate, I was in my 30s when we came to Canada. That's a beautiful question. You know, I have seen that actually in Jerusalem. While there is strife, there is also great bonding. Uh, there is great interaction. There is so much dialogue going on at a grassroots level. Now, here's the thing that I find in many, many places, including my own native land of Pakistan, is that the, the grassroots activists sometimes are the ones who do the best work because 
uh, you know, they don't have big funding, so they don't have agendas. They're just doing it because they're passionate for the cause. So if one can put, put aside preconceived notions and one, one is really passionate about bringing about change, I think that there is so much that we have in common. And we need to start talking about those commonalities. We need to start looking at times in history when, when uh, Jews and Christians and Muslims work together, when they develop together, when they talk to each other, uh, you know, when, when they read scripture together, when, uh, you know, art and art architecture was at its height. And I think that the only way we will progress and the only way we will develop is when, when members, a caring and passionate members of the three communities put aside the politics and come together on social issues and come together on issues of, of education and knowledge and development. Israel has so much to teach the whole world in terms of technology. You know, I usually laugh because when people in Pakistan are slamming Israel, I remind them that many of the instruments that they are using have been invented in Israel and have been created by Israel. But of course, none of that seems to, to matter to them, but one does have to point that out. So dialogue, discussion, um, you know, honest interaction uh, without judgment, respectful dialogue uh, without, without bringing in the politics is something that I think can take us a long way. And I've seen that in, in my years in Canada and in the interfaith. I have a very wonderful relationship with the Jewish community here in Toronto and outside. Why? Because we respect each other. Why? Because we have great dialogues. Why? Because we help each other. Uh, my organization, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, for the last five years has hosted an event for Holocaust Education Week. We're the only Muslim organization that does that. And, you know, it is a place where people come, they're surprised with their questions, but we're proud to do that. And even in terms of my being a Muslim who supports Israel, it's not something that I'm an apologist for. I'm proud to say that because there is so much I have learned in my 13 trips to, to Israel and it's a continuous journey. Um, I can't speak for the Jewish community, of course, maybe Cheryl or Lee can address that. But as far as getting to know them, if you want to email me, I'll be happy to introduce you uh, to the Jewish uh, community that I know, communities, I should say. Uh, I interact with them at a wonderful level. We hold events together. I'd be happy to invite you to such an event where you can meet them and get to know them and talk to them. Uh, again, it's all about getting to know each other. And so uh, feel free to get in touch with me and I'll be happy to do this for you. For How fine. wonderful is that, that a Muslim woman is going to introduce a Christian to the Jewish community. I mean, this is what it's all about. But just speaking for uh, Atlanta Israel Coalition, I could honestly say the whole goal is to be nonpartisan and bring people of all religions together. So I understand her feelings, I relate. Um, and I'm also happy, you know, if you want to reach out to me, please do. Although I'm here in the U.S., we're neighbors, right? Eh? Of course, of course. And in terms of Canada, or at least in Toronto, where I live, there are some uh, uh, Muslim Jewish Christian dialogues. There are groups that uh, embrace uh, newcomers. So uh, it should not be a problem. Hey, yes, that's a difficult one. Um, they are a little amazed, a little shocked, uh, sometimes critical, but when I travel and I speak to them and I explain to them the reasons why I do what I do, like I have to you, uh, they do tend to understand, which doesn't mean that they will come around and do a rara rally for Israel at any point soon. However, this, uh, let me mention here that Muslim countries, many Muslim countries are now actually ready to interact with Israel. Uh, we have the United Arab Emirates, we have Bahrain, we have um, Saudi Arabia. And because Saudi Arabia is looked upon in the Muslim world as a sort of an icon, at least in the Sunni Muslim world, 
once they accept Israel, you'll see that more and more Muslim countries will follow suit. And believe me if I tell you that within two years, there will be a shift. There will be a change because uh, in Pakistan, I now see people are talking about this. There was a time when Israel was just off the books and not to be discussed, but there are discussions now. There are discussions and debates, and that's a wonderful thing. That's a positive sign. So, uh, you know, they're cautious. Uh, they don't uh, give, you know, jump into the fray as quickly as I did, but uh, they are beginning to, to uh, they, they're ready to listen. Uh, they're ready to uh, ask the questions. Uh, they're ready to look at the change. I, I feel it's so important for, for them to meet people. This is why, uh, you know, that, that personal interaction, the human interaction is so important. And so, uh, yes, I believe that there is change in the air and it will be positive and it will happen soon. So for 1400 years, our scriptures have been translated and defined by men. Uh, the rights and uh, regular, you know, rights around uh, Muslim women have been decided by men. Uh, it's a totally patriarchal culture. It's a totally pa patriarchal practice. But I remind uh, people that if we go back to the seventh century at a time when women were bought and sold as slaves and, and newborn girls used to be buried alive in this really barbaric, uh, Arab culture, the message of Islam came as a breath of fresh air. Again, seventh century, because it gave women rights. It gave them the right to vote. It gave, gave them the right to fight in war. It gave them the right to keep their married name. It gave them the right to ask for marriage and ask for divorce without any problem. It's only the patriarchy, the later rulers, that uh, found that if they gave women equal rights, uh, their own uh, security <laughs> you know, was shaken. And we see this across the board. We see this in, in many parts of the world. It's just that Western women have uh, fought through the Industrial Revolution and through education and employment and economic stability. They have been able to fight for their rights. Women, for example, in my homeland of Pakistan, uh, sometimes don't have three meals a day. They don't have clean drinking water. They don't have a roof over their heads. They are not educated. So they don't have the wherewithal to be able to fight for their rights. And this is why it becomes incumbent on activists like me to speak for them, to become their voice, uh, to continuously be a thorn in the side of the patriarchy, uh, to give equal rights to women. So this is an ongoing journey. This is an ongoing battle. And I, I believe it will go on for the next generation and the next generation. But certainly things are, are better now than they were 50 years ago. And hopefully they'll be even better 50 years from now once we focus on education for women. That is the key. Well, I, I thank you for that question, by the way. It's a very important question. <clears throat> because I have been slammed by the left, I tend to call them the regressive left. And much of my work is sort of squeezed between the two extremes, you know, the extreme right and the regressive left. Now, I, I can't speak to it with full confidentiality because I, I don't know, but I think that they're very well funded. I think that there's a lot of money coming for them and it's all political. Everything is political. It's not that they have a passion for the cause. It's not that this is their, you know, heartfelt belief. I believe that there is funding from, you know, people who have a lot of money. And this is why they do what, what, what they do, because um, it's also, you know, a, a case of popularity. Uh, as you know, and as you have seen, it's very popular to bash Israel. It's very popular to be anti-Semitic. It's a, very popular to have the BDS movement, all of whom are supported by the regressive left. And we have to keep on slamming them at every opportunity that we have. It's unfortunate that, that naive people, even people of faith, get caught up in this drama and they don't question the status quo. They don't question the agendas of these people. You just have to scratch the surface 
and you'll find out, just connect the dots, and you'll know why that is. Now, this is where the Clarion Project has been so good because they expose these people. You know, they expose all kinds of extremism, including radical Islamist extreme, extremism. And they've done research. And in fact, in some of their articles, they've even tracked the money trail. So uh, it's important to keep on exposing these elements within our society who are not doing any good, but are trying to pull down those who are trying to speak out. You know, you can believe whatever you want, but to try and influence others to believe like you is no different than Islamist extremism and fundamentalism. I'd like to add that I think it comes from both sides. We're nonpartisan, and the difference I've seen from the hate that I've personally received, and, and please, Rahel, you know, tell me if it's different for you, but um, the left seems to be the extreme left. Again, I think it's both um, extremes. I think, thankfully, many of us are in the middle and we don't consider ourselves one or the other. Um, what I see, though, is that the left seems to be hiding under the guise of human rights when it's really hate. I call it human wrongs. And the right just shows you, the extreme right, shows you that they're just hateful. You yeah, I agree with you. I love, I love the term human wrong. Yes, yes. Uh, as opposed to human rights. You're, you're absolutely right. It's all based on hate. It's, uh, you know, and uh, let's face it, some of the, the animosity directed against Israel is also a bit of jealousy. This is to see how successful this small country is, you know, they have done so much in, in so little time. Now, around the, the nationalistic element of some of the Arab countries that surround Israel, Definitely, you know, there is a feeling of being peaked. Now you look at Iran. Uh, Iran doesn't even share a border with Israel, yet they vehemently hate everything about Israel and to the point that they want to annihilate them. Why? You know, you, you would want to ask the question why. Iran is oil rich, they have resources, but you know, their own deficiencies and their own defects come to the surface when they see a country like Israel. So I think that a lot of this is, is based on hate, which and they want to silence us. A beautiful question and a very important one as well. So the safe spaces start with a very few people. You know, it's not about large numbers. We are not looking at filling an auditorium of 2,000 people and then saying, you know, let's have a dialogue. It starts with a small group of people. And this is my personal experience. This is how it started with me. Small group of, of caring people, of passionate people, again, uh, those without agendas, those without being on the payroll of either the regressive left or the right. And I think you have to um, also suss them out because sometimes there are people who want to infiltrate for their own agendas. You know, get some, some people who really for the cause, get them around the table, let them then bring in other people from their communities. And so it grows until you have a sizable group of people who think the same, who want peace, um, and, and who are willing to have these conversations. So it doesn't happen overnight, as I said before. Um, you know, it takes time. Uh, people will come and go. They will, uh, you know, come to the groups. They may not like it, and that's fine. But it starts with a few people uh, who believe uh, in peace, who believe in human rights, who believe in truth and justice, and from there you expand. You for that question. So uh, books other than the Quran, the reliance of the traveler or books on Hadith is something that we can keep aside. It's not something that we follow because uh, there is no credible evidence that these are, uh, you know, books of knowledge or uh, yes, some Muslims do follow them, but I had never heard about the reliance of the traveler till about two years ago when I came here. It's not a book that the majority of the Muslims follow. Let me put it this way. Now the Quran, yes, is believed to be uh, the word of God, 
uh, it is the Muslim scripture and Muslims do follow it, but they have to understand that it has to be read in historical context because there are aspects of it which were for a certain time and place. They are time bound. So the Quran has two kinds of messaging. One is universal messaging and the other is time bound. And it, the message of the Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. And therefore there were times of war and there were times of peace. So those particular messages that may be considered anti-Semitic are to be left in the seventh century parking lot. It's not, it's not universal messages. This was a time when the Muslim communities were at war with other communities, the, the non-believers, the Jewish community, and this is the kind of guidance that was given to them. But it doesn't mean that this is how we have to believe uh, you know, universally. Having said this, of course, there are people who are dogmatic. This is why we call them fundamentalists. They don't look at the underlying layer. They don't look at the historical context, especially the extremists like ISIS, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda. They have always taken uh, verses out of context from the Quran. Now, they are Muslims, but they also use uh, the verses out of context to promote their own agendas. You know, they will say that, uh, for example, that jihad or armed jihad is justifiable in self-defense. So they say, well, we have been attacked by the United States. We have been attacked by Israel. We have been attacked by the West. So it is justifiable for us to now go to war against them and fight back. That's not the way it works. You know, that self-defense has to be done through a ruling, through a ruler, through discussion and debate. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the level of understanding is minimal. Uh, the, the, the level of interpretation is also minimal. And unfortunately, this has been misused throughout the centuries to create this division. But if a learned person, somebody with knowledge and with reason can look at it and say, okay, this was for the seventh century, it doesn't, it's not applicable today, then we are able to move ahead. I believe that definitely there is change coming and much of it is for the better, but that's because I am an eternal optimist and I believe in good. Uh, you know, when I look, and so, so we look at this in two parts. In the West, of course, there are, there's much more dialogue and discussion. There is much more interaction between Muslims and Jews. And therefore, I believe a lot of effort is being made on the ground by um, you know, by rabbis and imams and, and pastors, by uh, churches, synagogues and mosques, by people on the ground, by grassroots activists, um, is being, uh, you know, not all of it kosher, but a large part of it. And, you know, it is showing that change. Uh, in the Muslim world, as I said, if Muslim countries, after, you know, decades of uh, hating Israel, are beginning to accept uh, the right of Israel to exist, Definitely, it is a change for the better. And based on this, I think that this change will, uh, you know, work itself into other Muslim countries, and it will definitely make a difference. So people are speaking out, uh, even at the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, you know, you have Nikki Haley who spoke out and more and more people are saying, hey, you know, stop with slamming Islam now, uh, slamming Israel, uh, excuse me. So, you know, we, we don't want to take this uh, uh, without uh, speaking out. So, yes, uh, there is a change for the positive. At the same time, <laughs> anti-Semitism is on the rise. And, you know, even the COVID-19 um, uh, you know, pandemic has brought the Islamists out of their hell holes and, uh, you know, they're using this to promote their radicalization and extremism. But we have to remember, that every subversive group has an agenda which they use and misuse according to time and place. We are the ones who have to be cognizant. We are the ones who have to be careful. We are the ones who have to speak out. And we are the ones who have to keep on putting out the fires. Uh, you know, if anyone has any leftover questions, they should feel free to send them in to you. And if I can, I'd be happy to uh, address them. But uh, this has been very inspiring for me, just renews my commitment to Israel's existence, to supporting the Jewish community, to speaking out against anti-Semitism and hate against 
uh, Jewish community. And for many uh, people, they, they don't even separate Jews and Israel. For them, it's all mixed into one. And I think that that's a terrible thing. But, uh, you know, I want to uphold truth and justice and the human rights of everyone. And I hope that we can build further and go further together. We're very grateful to have you tonight. And we really do need to stand together. So I appreciate you coming and um, speaking with us all over the world. I know people have tuned in. Look forward to having you in Atlanta. Thank you. And um, yes, I, I am looking forward that, with, to that as well. And I leave you with a greeting of peace from my fate to yours, from my heart to yours, when we say salam and you say shalom, shalom. which is peace. Hello.